You are listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. All right. Do I, is this a buzzer? If I say something stupid? <laughs> or not appropriate? <laughs> <sighs> Come here, Colther. We'll try it on you. Oh, real quick. There's a young lady in the house who has a testimony from last Sunday. Um, when I Remember when I told you all, hey, this isn't word, a word of knowledge, but I want to go after healing by faith? She has a testimony. On? Yes, ma'am. Wasn't praise and worship awesome? Oh, thank you, Lord. That's not what he wanted me to tell you. (laughs) I I think it was a couple of Sundays or so ago. uh, We were sitting right behind Pastor Justin and Pastor Lisa. And uh, Pastor got up and said, is there anyone here that ha- is hurting in their wrist or hand from arthritis? And I raised my hand. He laughed and said, oh, I knew it was close to me. So I wasn't he- laughing at her pain. I just clarified <laughs> no. that. Okay. No. Uh, they're smart, Pastor. They got it. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> buzz. What's that buzzer? Anyway. <laughs> The anointing flows from him, understand that. So anyway, (laughs) uh, I'll get to it, I'm I'm sure. Anyway, so I went home. Then he asked, was anybody, we prayed, and was anybody feeling healed? And I didn't raise my hand because I didn't. And we went home, and the wrist and hand was still bothering me. Uh, Just to understand, I couldn't put hand lotion on or wash my hands really hard because if I pull my skin like that, oh, much pain. So so Monday it hurt. I remember that. Tuesday I didn't notice, and Wednesday I didn't notice. And last week I was talking to Pastor, and it just came out of my mouth. And he goes, why didn't you tell me? I said, because I just didn't notice. (laughs) Isn't that God? Progressive and sneaky. (laughs) He comes in the back door if you won't let him in the front. So, you know, so it's healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Pastor. No problem. Just slide that little button down. Well, you know, slider. So, y'all, listen, just everyone wants everything instant, including me. When I pray for people... If they don't get instantly healed, I'm like, come on, what in the world? But sometimes things happen. I mean, there's testimonies of people literally getting healed seven days later. And I want to tell you why I think that happens. Are you ready for this? It's in Daniel. Daniel was heard from the moment he humbled himself and turned himself to the Lord. But there was 21 days of warfare... Because the prince of Persia was resisting Gabriel from bringing the answered prayer. Ah. So sometimes things don't happen instantly because there really is a heavenly war going on right now. And I've had enough uh, encounters in recent weeks to know that the second heaven is lit up right now with warfare. And obviously you can see it in the natural right now. Um. I, I've like battled back and forth what to talk on this morning because it was like over the last couple of years I've, I've been telling the church that we've got to get a theology for suffering. Isn't that awesome? Are you all excited yet? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> but no, seriously, we have to have a, a theology for suffering. What do I mean by that? We have to understand what suffering is, what types of suffering, and how to prosper through suffering. 
and understand that there's actually an anointing that will fall on your life when you embrace the sufferings of Christ. So it's bittersweet. I want to tell you that, um, well, uh, we are not ready for the days ahead. I don't think we're ready for the, the outpouring of, uh, of God's glory, the intensity of it, and I don't think we're ready for the things that we'll have to suffer. I know that doesn't sound encouraging because we've been under an American gospel for decades and we've been super blessed and we've been super, um, like, you know, I mean, we really have. And I think, honestly, I think pr- prosperity is not bad. I think prosperity is probably one of the greatest tests a believer can have. Oh, uh, the Lord told Israel before they went into the promised land, he says, don't forget me when you go. And I'm convinced that too many times God is plan B in the American church. God's becoming plan A now. And it says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? I want to say that Jesus is very much a disruptor. And um, he doesn't give a flying flip about being politically correct. He didn't care about the political system in Israel. He didn't care about the religious spirit that wanted to murder him. And we have, um, in many ways, we, as the American church, have allowed cancel culture, politically correct, and simply fear of man to shut us down and not speak truth and love. Now, here it is. We have to speak truth and love, y'all. You, you can't get in front of somebody and say, you're a stupid moron, you should get saved. That's probably not how that should happen. Are you with me? I mean, Jesus isn't going to do that exactly, Right. But I kept having this phrase, Jesus the disruptor. And I can't get away from it, and I have no notes for it, so we're going to see where it happens. But Jesus wants to disrupt everything in a good way. You know, the enemy began to disrupt things in the last couple of years, and he had legal right to do so. Are you with me? See, when when we as a nation begin to pull away from the Lord... You're, God's not lifting his hand off of us. We're lifting, we're, we're pulling away from his hand of protection. And so then to the degree that we've pulled away from his protection, that allows the enemy to be able to come in. Are you with me? Now, we could sit here for two hours and argue theologically over the sovereignty of God and, and uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism and and it's God's will, everything's God's will, and we have no will, and all this stuff. But the reality is, we're, we're going through what I believe are changes that will never change. We're going through things that will never go back. Are, are you with me? So we're going to have to learn how to operate in a new wineskin. And you're going to have to, and th- this is what I believe is going to become believers' favorite scripture. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and loving not our life even unto death. Now, are we in a situation like, you know, first century Christians where they were being fed to the lions in the Colosseum for entertainment? No. There, there's, been, there's been moments in history in the last 2,000 years that have absolutely made this look like a cakewalk, but I'm telling y'all, wake up. Like, if you're not awake, wake up. Right now, what the world wants you to focus on is nothing more than a cover story for the enemy as he is literally undermining the very foundation of our nation and our Christian faith. Cancel culture is all about destroying what America was made about or what it was created for and actually introducing socialism, which turns into communism. And I'm going to tell you that the Antichrist system will absolutely be a Marxist system. Are you with me? So how do we partner with Jesus to disrupt this stuff in the process? Because we have a king with a government on his shoulders right now without end. And we don't lose. Are you with me? See, the, right now the enemy wants to demoralize you and get you to give up, to get hopeless, to get depressed, and to just go with the flow. He does. 
He, doesn't, he, he wants to scare you to death that if you actually stand up and say, I actually think that's wrong and let me tell you why, that, that somehow your life is going to be over. I just got flagged. Um, by the way, a little side note. Um, so sometimes I say things on social media, not mean, but just like truth, right? And the communist fact checkers don't always like the truth. And um, anyway, so there was something, there was a post made. And I, I'll be honest with you all, I'm not saying this was Jesus, but I said the CDC just needs to shut up. I know, I'm telling on myself, Woo! I know, could you, I, I did that. And, and literally, two seconds later, some dude goes, and you should too. So I've learned through social media spiritual warfare skills that I go, I go to the account, and I knew it was, a, it was a bogus account. And I said, silence, troll. Well, instantly, I got a warning on my account. And he comments instantly back. He goes, Facebook doesn't like the word troll. And I said, how much are they paying you? Whatever. So I, I say all that, that we have a website that we're streaming mainly from you. Uh, we stream from Facebook and YouTube, but it goes through a platform. If you find one Sunday that you don't see our live stream on Facebook, just go to YouTube, okay? Because I'm going to do my best and I'm going to stay on my best behavior, but our, our ministry page is tied to my personal account. So I'm like, I, yeah. But can I tell you, Jesus shows up on the scene, and over and over and over he says, again, you've heard that it was said. And all of a sudden, he comes and he wrecks the entire religious system. He wrecks so much of what they believe to be truth. And I want to tell you that Jesus is wrecking a lot of the structure of the church right now. And, and you're, you're seeing a dividing of sheep and goats. It says judgment starts first in the house of God. So that means we have to have our priorities straight. When I, I love it when you say something to someone and they what when they say, Don't judge me. What are they saying? They're saying, I love my sin, I want to stay in it, so leave me alone. Right? Jesus never said don't judge. Because he said make righteous judgments. And so we've gotten to the point where we're scared to death to say anything to anybody because they're going to accuse us of judging, right? And the truth is, you make judgments every day of your life. It says bad company corrupts good habits, right? So you have to make a judgment on whether or not you should be hanging around those people because they have the ability to affect your righteous behavior. Are you with me? In Matthew 5.33, Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely but shall perform the Lord what you have sworn. He, he's, he's literally tearing into the religious because of what they made the law. And Rich has got a book coming out, which I'm not going to even try to dive into, but it's all about the one new man. He's got a course the last two months of this year that's about the one new man. And interestingly, when Israel went into Babylonian captivity, they ended up focusing more on the oral, the spoken Torah. And that's when the traditions of men that Jesus hammered these guys for, that's when the traditions of men came in. Because everything was oral, right? So they, they all didn't have their scrolls with them. And I, uh, that's, that's what he came and began to fix, right? It says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus turns around and he says what? He goes, if you look with a woman, look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. So he goes from this external obedience, right? I explain it like this. You ever told your kid to sit down and they're, they're bowing up to you, right? Terrible twos or 16 or 13 or, or sometimes it's terrible husband and the husband won't listen or something. I don't know. Anyways, but you tell your kid, sit down. And finally they're like, <sighs> And they sit down and they're all, you know, torqued. They're not sitting down inside of their heart. 
there's an outward obedience there, but inwardly they're not in submission. See, there's a difference between obedience and submission. Jesus is calling us to live a, submission, a life submitted to the Holy Spirit, not just with outward obedience. Jesus said, look, he essentially called Israel, you hypocrites. He goes, you honor me with your mouth, but your heart's far from me. And so we can, we can fool people at times around us by, by having our religious hats on and outwardly looking like we're doing the right things, but inwardly we're in complete rebellion. I, I forgot who said this, but half-hearted obedience is cloaked rebellion. And, <laughs> okay. In Romans 13, when it talks about obedience to authority, do you understand that the moment a government begins to tell you not to worship God, you are to righteously rebel? I, I, I am beyond tired of hearing people twist that scripture. And they're just telling everyone, just do exactly what the government says, because Romans 13 Guess what? The moment the government is telling you to disobey God, they're, they're violating God's word. You have a mandate to obey Jesus over the government. Don't, don't, let, don't let a religious spirit that is full of fear tell you otherwise. Now, I will say this. There are times that we don't like what they're doing, absolutely, but it doesn't directly hinder us from being obedient to God. So there's a fine line there, right? And I'm being very careful right now. I just want to tell you that there, we will enter into days ahead that we're going to have to look disobedient to those around us to be obedient to Jesus. And if we don't stand now, you're not going to stand later. Listen, in 10 years, that's not the time to prepare. Now's the time. Now's the time that we take a stand, that we are the light, that we let our light shine, that, that we respond in righteousness and not in evil. We don't, re- we don't repay evil for evil. And, and I want to say that I believe the days ahead are going to be bittersweet. I think we're going to see the greatest outpouring ever. I think we're going to see God pour out like we've beyond our dreams. But I also believe that for those that don't know the Lord, it's going to be extremely turbulent because their reality is being turned upside down. Right? But if we're not careful, you're going to be... If you don't allow these shakings to cut loose things out of your life, then you're going to go into a tailspin also. And if you don't have peace in the midst of the storm, how are you going to offer them something they, that you say they don't have if you're responding just like them, if you have the same fear that they have? If, if, if there's no difference in our heart our behavior, why are they going to want the Jesus that you claim to know? And see, this, this is where we have to look into a mirror and say, Lord, what's in my life? And I don't care if anybody around me sees it. What's in my life? What's in my heart right now? A couple mornings ago, I was in my prayer time, and, well, I was starting to pray. <clears throat> I read my, my reading plan, and, and I could feel this. I was like, I didn't want to pray. Like, I legit didn't want to pray. I just wanted to do other busy stuff. And I was like, man, what, what is wrong? And I had to be honest with myself. I'm like, Lord, I'm mad at you right now. Because people are dying that should not be dying. And people that should die are not dying. That's actually biblical. I'm not passing condemnation. It, it was very clear... That is scripture, y'all. I'm not making this up. 
<laughs> and actually, the Lord said that, I believe, in Ezekiel. Because of the unrighteousness and the wickedness. And right now, it can look like the enemy's getting his way. He's not. But in the natural, it may look that way. Right? But... Watching, watching people suffer and die that absolutely should not be suffering and dying is, is obviously painful. And the, and the injustice in it. And, and walking alongside of so many, so many people going through so many things right now, I just hit a wall. In fact, Saturday I was working out with Chris and he asked me how I was doing. All of a sudden, I just started crying in the gym. I was like, that, you know, that, that last rep, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. But I literally, I, like, I had to sit down on the bench and just cry. And I didn't realize how much stuff I was trying to carry because, again, you know, false responsibility can sneak up on you. And every time I think I'm doing good with it, I realize I'm not over it yet. You know, and I realize, I'm, I'm, God, I'm angry at you. I'm, I'm tired of the injustice. Why did this person die? Why did this person die? Why did this person die? And if I'm honest with you, I'm like, hey, there's a few people in D.C. that have tons of blood on their hands. If anybody's got to go, maybe they could. Can I be real? Yeah, and, and, and by the way, if you have... If, you ever think your argument with the Lord's going to work out well? Um, I've argued with him several times, and I'm always wrong. But there is a healing process when you're honest with yourself and what's going on in your heart, and God's big enough to deal with it, and he knows where you need to get to. And, he, and, he, and it's like, you know, we feel like punching bags. Holy cow, Jesus has got to feel like the biggest punching bag in the world. And we're wrestling and we're going through all these emotions and we're living in, in an atmosphere that is so chaotic and so full of fear and turmoil right now that it's impossible for us to live each day and not feel the effects of the atmosphere that we're in, y'all. And so we have to be able to understand that Okay, I need to process, right? And if you just suck it up, buttercup, that's, gonna, that's not going to work out well for you. When, when I just try to like bury things that I can't control rather than processing my lies I'm believing in the midst of it, then I begin to get overwhelmed, and then the famous Mr. Grumpy Pants comes out. For those of you visiting, that's my wife's nickname for me when I've hit a wall with ministry. And, uh, and so... That doesn't help those around me, right? That doesn't help me. And in, in these turbulent times, we can allow the pain and the frustrations of the trials to speak louder than the voice of God. And if you're having a difficulty time hearing what the Lord's trying to tell, to, tell you, maybe because your soul's screaming louder. There's a a song by Jason Upton called In the Silence. And I, I think it's extremely important right now that we carve out time to be in the silence. And the lyrics go on to say, In the silence you are speaking. Do you know it's hard to get into the silence and be still and know he's God if you think you're in control of your life? Because if you think you're in control of your life and then you sit still and, and you're quiet and you listen, all of a sudden the helplessness that you feel underneath all of a sudden gets exposed because of your guardian lie. I got this. See, a lot of times we think we're abiding in the peace of Jesus and really all we're doing is going with the circumstances. 
And when the circumstances seem to be working out into our favor, our perception of how we believe they should work out, all of a sudden we're full of peace. And then all of a sudden those circumstances shift on us and we're in, we're in a roller coaster of turmoil. Why? Because the peace of Christ, it says, let the peace of Christ dwell. We have a conscious choice to let the peace of Jesus rule and reign inside of us to guard our minds and our hearts. And too many times, it's just like we think we have joy, but really we just have happiness because things are happening the right way. But joy, Paul talked about joy in a pit, in a dungeon. And he talked about the joy of the Lord. He, you know, when, when all of this stuff happens, I promise you, Curtis... I'm just telling Jesus right now, uh, I do have to keep talking, so help me. <laughs> when people go, you couldn't pry them back with, a, with the biggest crowbar in the world because their reward just became sight. We are the ones that grieve the loss of, people, of, of believers when they go, but they're not grieving. You know, this is one big practice run that says our life's a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes. So whether we're here for 60 years, 70 years, or 120 years... Only what we did for Jesus with the right motive is actually going to go with us. Again, remember, you can be obedient on the outside and rebellious on the inside. I think, I think that we need to do a lot of um, processing with our belief systems. And I think we need to realize there are things that we need to draw a line in the sand and be willing to die for. I don't mean pet doctrines, but there's things that we absolutely, you know, whether I live or whether I die, it's Jesus, right? Whether, whether God rescues me from the fiery furnace or not, I'm not bowing my knee to you. I've, I've shared this a couple of times, but, um, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to people that have raised the dead. I've talked to people that have raised 30-some people from the dead. And if you don't think that can happen, then you should start with your unbelief. And every time, they all seem to have the same answer. When I ask them, why do you think healings and miracles and signs and wonders happen so much easier in other countries. And it's always the same answer. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. You all doing okay? Am I making any sense? Okay, good. I just have cried a lot and said a couple of things. <laughs> You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm. What did Jesus turn around and say? Yeah. What do you think it's like for the church right now in Afghanistan? For the ones that stayed back so they could preach the gospel? Now, seriously, I'll like... Just for one moment, think about that. Think about if we were in Afghanistan right now. I caught myself. I almost said something that was not nice. And everything happened out the way it just happened. 
And you literally, no greater love than this, that a man should lay his life down for his friend. No, you go, I'll stay. And then they literally begin to knock on doors. And they start telling these Muslims about Jesus, knowing that the very next door they knock on could be the end of their life. And they keep knocking. You talk about, we can't even get people to go out in the streets of Kerrville, Texas for crying out loud, and you're not going to get shot. Somebody might say you're a moron or something, but oh, big deal. Pack up your Legos and go. Literally. The gospel. Door by door. And the church exploded in salvations in recent weeks in Afghanistan. Because there were some firebrands that said, we overcome by the blood of, our, blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and loving our lives not even unto death. See, if, if we find life by losing it for Jesus' sake, and you're not happy right now, Maybe because you're not dead. So to the degree you take up your cross is to the same measurement that you're actually going to find abundant life. Some of you, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, need to die to some things and quit acting like you can't get free of them and be honest with yourself. You love them. And then in your honesty of loving your sin, you go to Jesus and say, you know what, Lord? The only reason I haven't stopped this is because I actually love this. And I know my heart's wrong. Will you meet with me in this place? Because honesty and responsibility is the first step to freedom. But if we sit here and act like victims and say, oh, well, I just can't get free of this. No, be honest. You don't want to. The hu- Do you realize, the? am, am I stepping on anybody's toes? Yeah. I mean it in love. <laughs> I'll step on my own toes. God chooses not to violate our will. And the enemy can't. So at the, end of the, at the end of our life, we can't sit here and say, oh, well, the enemy made me do this. Oh, I couldn't get free of the enemy. No, you were partnering with him. That's why it's called deception. Right? So I want to encourage you. If, if there's some things in your life right now that you know shouldn't be, stop making excuses, stop lying to yourself, be honest with yourself, and be honest with the Lord. Because he knows what you're believing already. He knew I was mad at him. I repented. It's not his fault, right? I can't believe the lie, and I can't attribute steal, kill, destroy to the Father of lights, who only gives good gifts. So either we believe that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, or we don't. Either we believe that he's a good dad, and if we ask for a fish, we'll get a fish. If we ask for bread, we'll get bread. We won't get rocks and snakes. Right? The goodness of God. You've heard it said of old, but I say this. And I think Jesus is saying to us right now, you thought this was truth, but I say this is truth. You thought this is the way you did this, but I tell you today, this is the way you do this. See, the thing about stepping into a new wineskin is that, by the way, what's really awesome, in ancient times, they wouldn't throw wineskins away. They would actually take the old wineskin, they would soak it in water, and then they would soak it in uh, oil and leave it there. And it would recondition the wineskin. See, in order for you to stay in a new wineskin, you got to have a new mindset, right? And and Jesus is saying, you've heard it said of old. Oh, you thought this is the way we're going to do church tomorrow, but this is really what we're going to do. See, we've spent so much time arguing about corporate church and home church and and how home church is superior over corporate church, and we can just throw corporate church out the window. Let me break something down to you. It's not either or, it's both. And the only reason they were only in the homes in Acts is because of persecution, people. 
the temple was destroyed. But while the temple was still there, guess what? Followers of Jesus were in the temple. What were they doing? Praying because he says, my father's house will be a house of prayer. So they were still there. And they met in the home and broke bread daily. And they loved each other. They actually liked to be together more than two hours on Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying? I I think we're getting there. I I think we like each other enough, right? Sometimes you may not like me, but I like you anyways. So get over it. (laughs) Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Danny Silk wrote a book called Keep Your Love On. Is it not getting a little bit of trying right now with keeping your love on? Is it not just a... I think it is, y'all. The average pastor lasted five years in America at a church. That was before 2020. Do you think you need to be praying for the leadership in the body of Christ right now? Imagine their role, their pastoral duties and what they're going through, navigating through things that we've never thought would even happen, right? We, we have got to stick together. We have got to, we have to choose to love our enemies even, right? That means probably Justin doesn't tell someone to shut up. Yeah, but you know, Jesus, Peter wanted to call fire down from heaven and destroy an entire city. And G- what did Jesus say? Dude, you don't know what spirit you're of. Do we know what spirit we are of? What if the person that we're trying to beat into submission with our words, what, what, if, what if they're the next Paul? I know one thing, those in Afghanistan, the church staying behind, knocking on the doors, they may, they may find a Paul. Yeah. Think of their dedication. Think, think, of a, think of a Muslim's dedication and then flip that for Jesus. I want to encourage you. Don't check out. Are you with me? Do not check out in these times. It is so easy to check out right now. It's so easy for us to disconnect and disassociate from the reality of what we're going through and the reality of things, of people, what they're going through. It, that, and... I help people every week recover the broken places in their souls, right? And everyone has their PhD in deny and suppress. We all do. (laughs) But, so... But not listen, y'all, now is the time. If you got things brewing in your heart, it's not going to get easier. The reason why there's so much pressure on us is because of the lies we believe. Do you understand that you can't feel pain without a belief behind it? If, if, if you feel the pain of being helpless, it's because you believe you're helpless, I don't care what you know in your head. Hello, James, double-mindedness. I know this, but I believe the opposite. I feel the opposite. Hello, your emotion is the bridge back to your belief. And we have to understand what being renewed in the spirit of our mind really looks like, what it is. You can't counsel a wound into wholeness. You need an encounter with Jesus to restore your soul. And... There's a reason why we're doing Keys to the Kingdom next week. Because it's all about inner healing and deliverance. And I'm going to tell you that you might just have an issue that isn't even you. Mm -hmm. 
but you haven't been taught because so many people are afraid to talk about the D word. Demon. How dare you say a Christian could have a demon on them? Are you with me? Jesus did deliverance on the children of Abraham, y'all. He wasn't delivering the lost. He was delivering the church. And a third of his ministry was delivering the church. If y'all would start delivering the church, I wouldn't have a three-month waiting list. No, seriously, y'all, this is a serious thing because there are things, there are cycles of defeat in our life that we feel like we can't get free from, and we're literally loving and nurturing and reading the Word, and we're doing all these amazing things, but it's not producing fruit because you're counseling a demon. But it's actually a familiar spirit. You think it's your thoughts, you think it's your feelings, and you think it's your actions. But really, it's a spirit that's attached to you that's built a stronghold of lies so he can stay safe in darkness attached to you who is light. Strongholds, which are weapons of warfare, are not carnal but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are not demons, but they are built by demons because you get a spirit next to you that's a disembodied giant because demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim and they have desires. They have a soul. They think, they desire, they act. And you think those thoughts are your thoughts. And all of a sudden you begin to entertain those thoughts. And then those thoughts that produce feelings, you begin to act on those feelings. And now all of a sudden you're partnering with a spirit and you don't even know it. This should not be. And the church used to have a... If you go back and look in church history, inner healing and deliverance was always there. But we just got so smart, we thought we'd just counsel them out. Yeah, or we just, we, we, we numb their voices with pharmacia. Remember Revelation 18. If you want to remember a scripture that is applicable for right now in this moment, Revelation 18 says all the nations partook of the sorcery of Babylon. That Greek word is pharmacia. If you think mandates for taking a jab are going to leave you wrong. It's a part of the beast system. There are things that are shifting very quickly right now. And you need to know this. I'm not an anti-vaxxer, by the way. I'm just anti-vax of a lot of the crap they're putting into our kids' bodies and causing autism. And I recognize this is going to probably upset some folks right now, but I can't sit idly by, no truth, and know what the enemy's doing, and then not talk about it. And if we don't navigate through all these things correctly, we're just going to fall into division. And that's what stinks. The truth divides. It does. I'm okay if I, if I speak truth in love and that brings division. I'm fine with that. But if I'm preaching my opinion and not truth and that brings division, that's not okay. Or if I'm conveying truth from a place of bitterness or judgment, that's not okay. We, we have to speak truth and love. And uh, can I encourage you all? It's okay to debate. Are, are you with me? You, you can, you, it's okay to disagree. If you take our leadership right now, we have different perspectives on stuff, and we all love each other and we get along. And, and at one point, um, we, we had different perspectives on the 70th week of Daniel and how everything goes into the millennial reign. We can't afford to let small things divide us. We all believe Jesus is coming back physically, right? At least I hope we do. And that's what matters. Jesus is our focal point. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Right now, 
there, there's such a spirit of division that's longing to divide the church, longing to divide us via politically, medically, and all these things. Listen, right now we still live in the best country in the earth. We live in the best state of all the states. Yeah. Yeah. And, Texas! And, and we actually have freedom, right? And Jesus said he came for freedom. Listen, well, I already said that example. Um, anyways, I know I'm starting to rabbit trail, so I'm going to close. Let me finish with this. Right now, there's over 340 million Christians living in places where they'll experience high levels of persecution and discrimination right now. There's 4,007. 161 Christians killed for their faith. That was a few months back. 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings attacked. 4,277 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. It says, For this is a gracious thing, When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. I think one of the biggest challenges we have when you suffer injustice is to actually leave room for the Lord to vindicate you. Did you hear that? I remember a long time ago, I heard John Paul Jackson teaching, and the Lord told him, you don't have a right to be right, you have a right to be dead. And so many times when we suffer, you know, injustice, we feel like we have to come to our own defense. We have to vindicate our name. We have to vindicate our character because of the accusations of someone. But the truth is, God is our vindicator. We have to leave room for him to vindicate us. And we have to love those that are persecuting us. What would it look like, rather than you trying to put the wrath of God on someone when they did something wrong to you, that you actually love them, bless them, do something kind for them, and allow room for the goodness of God to bring them to repentance? It's real. The battle is real. Let's stand. By the way, I just want to say this. This is another one of uh, uh, when Jesus said, turn your cheek. Right? If If they strike you, turn your cheek, offer the other cheek. That is in the context of preaching the gospel. And and someone gets offended with the word. You don't punch them out because they didn't accept Jesus, right? (laughs) Like you offer them the other, like that's your righteous response. When someone walks up to you for absolutely no reason and tries to jump you and beat you up, it's totally righteous to defend yourselves, okay? Don't fall into the trap to think that we're just, you know, rugs that have to be trampled upon at every moment. It's a righteous thing to protect your family. Yeah? And we're in an amazing state that is passing laws to protect the constitutional rights that many people have bled and died for, right? Just like there's no, it says there's no uh, forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. I want to tell you this, whether we like it or not, there's, there's no freedom main, bought or maintained without shedding of blood. And we need to be very thankful for the men and women that have fought for our safety and the police officers that get spit on and jumped on and, and we need to be thankful for them. 
because God put them there. They're the peacemakers, and we need to support them. And by the way, we opened our doors to the Ingram Police Station in November. They're going to do a three-day training here, the police officers. And we're going we're gonna to bless them and give them some gifts and buy some meals. And so, you know. <clears throat> Okay, I, I want to ask one last honest question as I stop. Is, no. I, I want to ask you, and I mean this, and you can, like, it, you're not going to offend me. I hope I'm saying things that you don't always agree with. Can I, so have I ever said anything you weren't sure about? You're like, huh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Good. No, I'm serious. And so you go to the Word It says the Bereans were commended because they actually searched the scriptures daily to see if what was being said was true. Like, listen, this isn't about itchy ears. If no one's hands were raised, I need to preach harder. We need to preach harder. Whoever's up here, you need to be challenged by the word. The word is a sword. It's a double-edged sword. It cuts. It pierces between soul and spirit and joint and marrow, right? And it's the very discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And so if God's word isn't piercing us to the quick of who we are and challenging our belief system, then we're not growing. So we absolutely need to be challenged. And you need to challenge each other, right? Okay. If the prayer team, Rich's prophetic folks who come up here, and the prayer people. Yes, ma'am. What's that? Pardon? Yes. And... Uh, if you, and also, if you need healing, we're, we're uh, going to go after it again. And if, if you question whether or not you know Jesus, please don't leave here. Don't, don't leave here wondering if you really know him or not. In my old Baptist days, I got saved every time we had revival. I was baptized so many times I knew the tadpoles by their first name. No, sorry. I know, it's like a dad joke. Anyways, <laughs> but I, I, I like, don't leave here. Don't, don't allow the enemy to whisper to you and, and you just like, oh, I'll deal with it later. No, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that God wants to meet you and cha- absolutely change your life so that you're reborn in a brand new creation. So, okay, so Father, I just... Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.